So hopefully you got my email about class being canceled on Monday. And then the plan is, is that you can either come to today's lab and then not have to worry about lab next week, or you can come to Monday's lab next week. But there won't be a lab on Wednesday. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So um, on your quizzes, I was interested to know that a lot of you put absolutely nothing for your epigenetics. <laughs> And I was like, oh, I was so bummed out because this is like one of the coolest new things in genetics, right? It's the big headline of genetics. This is this ability of our environment to affect gene expression. And so one of the things that um, we watched in the video was this idea that nurturing can affect the way that the genes are expressed, right? So um, at learn.genetics, there was some videos about epigenetics that I mentioned. And one of them was a little simulation where you can actually um, investigate um, what licking does to the, gene, the genes, right? So, oops. Okay, so I'm gonna lick this rat. Okay, I'm licking it a lot. What is happening to my genome? It's straightening out, right? seriously activated your pup's GR gene. Your pup will have an easy time relaxing after stress. Your pup's GR gene will most likely look like this for the rest of its life. In fact, the amount of nurturing you gave to your pup will have a major impact on its adult personality. Okay, so let's try another one. Okay, so I'm going to be a poor looking mother. I'll look right there and look back here. It looks like you had better things to do since you didn't lick and groom your pup very much. Its GR gene is still inactive. Your pup will have a hard time relaxing after stress. Your pup's GR gene will most likely look like this for the rest of its life. In fact, the amount of nurturing you gave to your pup will have a major impact on its adult personality. Okay, so that was just one example, right? So the other example that um, was in the video was this idea that nutrition, so what you can eat can express, can affect your gene expression. And the biggest example of this in nature is um, when we look at queen bees, for example. Queen bees are only queen bees because they have been fed royal jelly. And so royal jelly has some, some, something in it that activates the gene that causes a normal bee to become the queen bee. So it's not the genetics that um, she inherited, it was actually what she was fed as a larvae, right, that determines her gene expression. And so there's some other examples about gene expression. Um, I can't remember which ones they use. Okay. So your mother's diet during pregnancy and your diet as an infant can affect your epigenome, right? So we talked about the agouti gene. And then, um, oh, this is the bee's royal jelly, right? So there's a cup um, where the larvae are um, put into, and they're filled with royal jelly, and that's the, the nutrition that actually affects the gene. So the idea of epigenome, right, is that it's something other than the genetic code that um, can be um, um, can affect, and it has to do with gene expression. And so we talked about how it has to do with tags that are added to the DNA that cause the DNA to either be tightly wound or loosely wound, and that affects the ability of the the um, DNA to be transcribed into messenger RNA. Okay. okay. So are there any questions about that epigenome? Probably going to be on the final. It will be on the final. Okay. okay. Also, we should have another quiz. And so should, we could have a quiz um, on Monday. How does that sound? Is everybody going to be here on Monday? Okay. So let's have a quiz on Monday. So this is actually the sixth quiz. And so we only actually have five quizzes. And so this can replace one of your low quiz scores, right? because I'm gonna drop the lowest quiz score. So if you do really well on this one, um, then you can use it in replacement for one of your um, quizzes that you did might not have done so well on. 
Okay. Or if you do really bad on this quiz, then you can drop this one. Okay. Okay. So today we're going to talk about some examples of biotechnology. And we actually already investigated one in lab, which had to do with DNA fingerprinting. And so if you'll remember that DNA fingerprinting is the ability to distinguish between the different genomes of individuals and also the genomes between cells, like for example, a cancer cell and a normal cell. So DNA fingerprinting has um, been um, used to also determine um, uh, DNA from a crime scene versus the DNA that's collected from the different suspects. And so you'll notice here that these are the DNA samples. So what do these lines represent? Do you remember from lab? What are these lines? I asked you, what is here of that line that's making it stain darkly? Your chromosomes. Okay, that's on the chromosomes. So what did we separate out when we were doing the gel electrophoresis? What was it that we separated? Anybody remember? So in this particular instance, what they did is they took DNA from the crime scene, so it could have been from blood, but it also could have been from hair or skin, right? And then they uh, took the DNA and they digested it, right? So they broke the DNA down into different fragments, and then they separated out the fragments based upon their size. So these are DNA fragments. And remember that the restriction enzymes will digest the DNA depending upon the sequence so that the, the fragments are gonna be different um, in, in suspect one, two, and three, right? So for this particular sequence, the crime scene DNA matches up with that from suspect two, right? But then they would also have to determine how common that um, particular um, uh, allele or gene is in the, in the population or that particular sequence is in the population and they would have to compare it to a database, right? So it could be that there are many people that might have this particular sequence. And so as we did in lab, remember that they compare many, many, many sequences. And then when you multiply those probabilities together, you start to get small numbers. of What is the probability that another person from that same ethnic background would have that exact same DNA fingerprint, okay? They also use DNA fingerprinting to determine um, to determine um, paternity. So they don't use blood typing anymore to determine paternity. So if you wanted to determine whether or not you were the father of a child, you would have a DNA test done and they would look at the, the DNA uh, fingerprint. Okay. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is what is called molecular cloning. And this is where we make a copy of a particular protein. So we have proteins in our body um, that are coded for by DNA. And if we wanted to make a lot of that protein, we could hijack the cellular machinery of a cell and make it do the work for us instead of putting it into a factory and trying to make a lot of protein in a factory. And so they use bacteria for this. Okay. And so the bacteria... Um, have interesting, um, instead of chromosomes, they don't have chromosomes, they have what are called plasmids. So plasmids are pieces of circular DNA. Oh, my pen's not going to work today. Plasmids are pieces of circular DNA. So they do not have chromosomes, they just have plasmids. And also bacteria are prokaryotic, which means they do not have a nucleus, right? So their genetic material is just kind of floating around in the cell. And one of the really interesting things about bacteria is, is that they can incorporate, they can take up plasmids from their environment, okay? So in molecular cloning, what we do is we insert a gene into a, a foreign gene into a plasma, into a plasmid, sorry, into a plasmid. And then insert the plasmid into the bacteria. Okay, 
So the gene is going to have a switch on it, which turns it on. And the bacteria is going to produce the foreign protein. So the bacteria is used as a factory to produce foreign protein. So in the example of the first thing that was, or one of the first things that was used um, um, and produced by molecular cloning was insulin. So insulin is a hormone that is needed by people that have diabetes. Specifically, some people have type 1 diabetes that they might have been born with or that early on, right? And then they can get the insulin from the bacteria and use it to treat the diabetes. Yes, Michael? Um, if it is not of the right kind, yes. And you can also, your body can actually also just ignore it. So that's type 2 diabetes where your body actually just ignores the insulin and your cells become um, insulin resistant. Then you still die. Um, then you get type 2 diabetes, and so you, then you have to regulate it with your diet. So you have to be very careful. Yeah. So there's different types of insulin. So hopefully you can find an insulin that's going to not make you sick and, re and you're not going to reject. Okay. So insulin is a drug, right? It's a hormone used to treat diabetes. Okay, so in your book, there's a diagram of this process, and it looks like this, right? So I have my foreign DNA, and I digest it just like I did before, and I get the gene, and I try to get the gene to stick into the plasmids. So when, the, when you notice, when we get our digestion of the DNA, that when a restriction enzyme cuts the DNA, it leaves what are called sticky ends. And these sticky ends are bases that do not have a complementary pair. So those are called sticky ends. And if the sticky ends match up, then what's going to happen is, is that's going to get picked up by the plasmid. And then the plasmids can be put into the bacteria. And then we can just like have a big fermentation chamber of bacteria, right, which are growing and reproducing. And then they produce the protein. And so then we can harvest the protein from the um, from the bacteria now not all of the bacteria will pick up and and express the gene so we have to have a mechanism by which we can detect whether or not they express it so it's kind of like that idea that we saw in the video where you could like put something that glows in the dark right so you know that an organism has picked up the gene if it glows in the dark because um, that um, inserted into that gene was a a, a protein that would glow, right? And so that was the jellyfish gene that they inserted into um, fruit flies, right? To make their wing spots glow, okay? So that is molecular cloning, okay? Now we can also talk about therapeutic cloning. And this comes in when we are um, trying to um, treat a particular illness rather than producing a whole nother individual by cloning, okay? So this is the treatment of disease. Okay. So um, we have the ability to repair and regenerate um, diseased tissue through stem cells, right? So stem cells are unspecialized cells that can repair damage in the body. So they're unspecialized, meaning that their genes are still all turned on and it can become anything. So it could become a nerve cell, it could become a muscle cell, it could become a liver cell, right? So they can become anything, any kind of cell. And the idea here is, is that we want to produce stem cells. Like say, for example, if I had a disease and I needed stem cells, could I therapeutically, could I, through biotechnology, produce stem cells? I have stem cells in my body, but they're hard to find. 
So could I produce stem cells for myself and then insert them back inside me? Okay. So the way that this works, this cloning works, right, is you have an adult. So I have an adult somatic cell. So it could be a skin cell, it could be a liver cell, it could be a mammary gland cell, which was actually the first um, reproductive cloning, right? And then what I do is I take the nucleus. So I remove the nucleus. And place it into a and what am I say e nucleated egg cell. Let me spell that right. Place it into sorry e nucleated Okay, so enucleated means without a nucleus. So I'm going to take um, one of my cells and I'm going to take my nucleus out of my cell and I'm going to put it into a egg cell that has had its nucleus removed, right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a little shock, it's a little electrical shock, right? And then I'm going to um, induce it to undergo mitosis. So the egg cell. undergoes mitosis and produces a multicellular embryo or multicellular, you could call it embryo, I guess. It could potentially become an embryo if my goal was reproductive cloning, but my goal in this case is not, okay? So my egg cell that has the um, my nucleus put into it, then undergoes cell division. And so I have all these stem cells, right? right? My early stage embryo is just a solid ball of cells, right? And then these stem cells are put back into the person that they've been taken out. So these are stem cells. These are embryonic stem cells, okay? And then they're put back into donor. Right. That's put back into the donor. Okay. So if you think about a child that might have a really bad um, uh, genetic disease, um, like maybe leukemia or they have um, uh, cancer of the bone marrow, this would be a way to treat that. This would also be a way to treat uh, people that have degenerative diseases, like maybe multiple sclerosis, like maybe Alzheimer's, this would be a possible way to treat that, okay? So that is therapeutic cloning. Okay. Now, um, I'm not sure, I actually, I should have looked this up, but. Um, Obama, I believe, lifted the ban on producing new um, stem cells, new em new embryos, so that you can actually have um, this occurring, right? So that you can have therapeutic cloning, but reproductive cloning in humans is not allowed in our country, and kind of worldwide, there's like a ban on it. So every once in a while, you'll hear that somebody reproductively cloned a human. But we haven't actually proven that um, that it has actually been done. So somebody will, you know, in some far off country will say, we did it. And then we'll like, we'll prove it. And they're like, oh, never mind. We didn't really do it. Right. So, <laughs> okay. So that's kind of where we are with reproductive cloning. Okay. Okay. So if we look at reproductive cloning, right, this is to produce a whole nother um, individual. So this is the production of a new individual that is genetically identical to the donor. Okay. So the first 
What was the first organism they were able to do this with? Does anybody know? Sheep, right? And the sheep's name was Dolly, right? And this is kind of silly, but Dolly was derived was um, um, from a the nucleus of a mammary gland cell, and so I guess the the joke was is that it's Dolly Parton. Pardon, how do you say her name? Pardon, right? Dolly, she's got big mammary glands, right? So Dolly is the sheep. Okay, so the nucleus was taken. <coughs> from a mammary gland cell. And then it was put into just the same process, an enucleated egg, and then the embryo developed, and then they put it into a surrogate mother. And so the surrogate mother then gave birth to um, the, um, um, to Dolly, okay? So in your book, they have a picture of this, okay, an image of this. So this is the mother. These are her mammary gland cells, right? We take the nucleus out of an egg cell, and this was actually a, um, a different, they used a different um, breed just to make sure that when they um, got the offspring, that it was um, like the um, Ben Dorset, not like the Scottish Black Dips, okay? So then what they did is, is that they put that nucleus into this, they developed an embryo, and then they put it into the surrogate U, and then this is Dolly, okay? So one of the really interesting things about Dolly is, is that she had a pretty short lifespan, and one hypothesis is, is, is that she aged faster than normal. So why do you think she aged faster than normal? Something that we've talked about in terms of what controls the cell cycle. Yes, exactly. Okay. So because she was derived from a mother, right, that was an adult, her telomeres were artificially short, right? So she had shortened telomeres. So part of her, she did not have a full mitotic clock, right? So um, she didn't live as long as a normal sheep would. So she had shortened telomeres due to mothers or donors. Who's the mother here, right? Donors mitotic clock. So we could ask, why would you want to clone a sheep? It's cool. It's kind of cool. Okay. So what might be the benefit of cloning a sheep? And one benefit would be is if your sheep was very special, like if it was already genetically engineered. So if you had a genetically engineered sheep, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, and then you could clone it, then all the offspring would also be genetically engineered, and you wouldn't have to go through the whole process of trying to get the gene that you want into the individual again, okay? So let's look at transgenic organisms. Actually, let's skip through gene therapy. Okay, transgenic organisms, okay? So transgenic organisms have been genetically modified. So this is, when we talk about genetic modification, it's generally transgenic, right? So genetically modified to contain genes from another species. So generally, species are isolated from one another because they don't reproduce, right? Individuals of different species cannot reproduce successfully. So you have some genetic isolation. So there's really, um, there are some ways that genes can hop from one species to another, like maybe the mosquito or a vector or a virus, right? Some genes can hop. But in general, species are isolated from one another. So this is um, genetic engineering, right? So through, maybe, through 
genetic engineering. Okay. So um, one thing that they've been doing is instead of using bacteria to produce uh, pharmaceuticals, sometimes they use um, mammals. And they use mammals because mammals produce milk. So these transgenic organisms um, contain, for example, a good example of this, is um, sheep or goats. Well, the video I'm going to show you in a minute is with goats. Goats that contain human DNA and produce human protein in their milk. Okay. There's also goats recently that produce a spider, they have a spider gene, and then they actually produce silk in their milk, right? So it doesn't have to be human DNA, but it has to be a DNA from a different species, okay? Sometimes this is what is referred to as farming, right, haha. -ha. So instead of a um, F, right, it's pH. So this is pharmaceutical industry producing organisms that produce drugs in their milk. And then they can obtain the drug from the milk, right? So if we had a goat that was genetically engineered, it would be really helpful to then clone that goat, right? because then we could have all these clones that would have the exact same um, DNA and that could produce the same um, um, uh, pharmaceutical, okay? So I'm gonna show you a video that talks about how this process, how the scientists first started doing this, and then talks a little bit about some of the, just very briefly about the ethical considerations of it, okay? about the new gene, and there was only one way that could be done. The egg was then re-implanted into a, into a uh, surrogate mother, and then the uh, animals were born. And of course, then we had to ask whether any of the animals that were born uh, contained that DNA inserted into its, in, into its own DNA. Some of the baby mice, just a precious few, did contain human DNA among their own. Now the question was, would they actually produce human protein in their milk? They did. The amounts of material that we made in truth weren't very great, but those first animals clearly established a principle. For the first time, a non-human animal was making a human protein. But as the raw material for a new industry, most milk has obvious disadvantages. What was needed was a bigger animal, an animal that makes milk for a living. Alan Smith turned to Tufts University Veterinary School, which saw the technology as a possible shot in the arm for an ailing rural economy. Frank Lowe. My interest as dean of the school was to help New England find a new agriculture, a smart agriculture, to replace the traditional agriculture uh, of this region, dairy farming. Dairy farming is in decline, sadly. Someone wanted to find another dairy animal uh, whose milk would be valuable for reasons that are different from the traditional reasons. Goats were Tufts animals of choice. They make a lot of milk, and their gestation period of five months is about half that of a cow's, an important fact for a technology you don't know has worked until animals are born. The human gene they hope to transplant into goats is for a drug used to treat heart attacks. A couple days after they were born, they would be tested for uh, the transgene, whether they contain the transgene or not. 
And once we identify a transgenic animal, then we have to let that animal grow to maturity. The human gene that's been injected into a fertilized goat egg makes a protein which dissolves the blood clots that can trigger heart attacks. As a drug, such a clot buster presently costs thousands of dollars a dose. The hope is that the baby goat about to be born will produce millions of dollars of the clot buster in its lifetime. <laughs> Yeah. All black, huh? This could be the most valuable animal ever born. <laughs> now, a second goat is in labor. But this time, there could be a disaster. The kid's head is bent backwards. Pulling it out could break its neck. It's a common enough problem to confront a veterinarian, and nothing to do with the fact that the kid may or may not contain a human gene. But the chance that this single goat, if born alive, could produce enough of the clock-busting drug to treat hundreds of heart attack victims raises the stakes enormously. <laughs> The kid is fine. Mother and biologist are exhausted. This is where the certainties of science meet the uncertainties of nature. Too hard. The kids are taken away from their mothers and fed formula. Usually the mothers clean and nurse their newborns, but these kids are potentially too valuable to risk the passage from mother to kid of disease. Two days later, these kids were tested to see if they contained human DNA. They didn't. They are, after all, just ordinary goats. Rome wasn't built in a day. We knew that in our minds. We didn't know it in our hearts. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, work that requires infinite patience, great attention to detail, and uh, Murphy's Law is uh, played out repeatedly. As the Tufts team continued to struggle with Murphy's Law, elsewhere, the technology was already paying off. Edinburgh, Scotland, the location of a company founded on a mouse. The mouse was the creation of John Clark. Clark took the basic idea behind putting a valuable gene into a mouse, but changed the details. One day in June 1990, after hundreds of mice had been manipulated, he ran a standard lab test on the latest. Its human gene wasn't just working, it was pumping out unprecedented quantities of human protein. So, I mean, what else we want to do in that situation when we uh, made such a breakthrough? We went straight down to the pub, I showed it to my two colleagues who were in there. Uh, it was still flushing around in the, the standing bar, I guess. So, so, I think the people in the pub will be really crazy uh, because we ordered yet another round to, uh, to celebrate uh, the achievement. Not so much our achievement, we thought the achievement of the mouse. So it was a great mouse. But in this part of the world, 
Sheep are the animals that count. A company was founded to move John Clark's mouse breakthrough into sheep and commercialize the production of human proteins in their milk. One of these proteins is factor nine, used to treat people with hemophilia. Another, called AAT, could be used to treat a deadly genetic lung disease. Already, some of the sheep are producing 30 grams per liter of human protein in their milk. Some of these are factor nine, and one of them at least is AAT. Mammary gland is a mammalian system by definition, and it turns out that it's a very good factory. And sheep are the furry factories walking around in fields, and they do a superb job. This is a litre of milk from one of our transgenic sheep. And if it was the sheep that contained 30 grams per litre, that is the amount of protein that would be contained in this litre of milk. So first of all, they do the chemistry, and the second thing they do is they make a lot of it, and they do it very cheaply. 30 grams of the company's first product, the drug to treat lung disease, is worth over $1,000. The sheep that make the drug are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. For security reasons, only the company knows which animals are drug factories in sheep's clothing and which are just sheep. The fear isn't only of theft. Police say they're not yet linking the incident with a fire that was deliberately started at another animal research center at Pennycook and the fire. The animal rights movement has taken a militant turn in recent years. This firebombing was of an animal research laboratory near the Sheep Project. Jane Frankie, BBC reporting Scotland, Bangladesh. It dramatized the opposition many people have to what appears to be yet another way humans have found to exploit animals. Of course, we, we are concerned about those people who hold very deep-seated views on the use of animals, so-called animal rights people. And for many of them, it's just a firm belief that you shouldn't use animals at all for anything. You shouldn't eat them, you shouldn't take water from them, you shouldn't take eggs or milk from them. And for those people, there really is no way that you can present a logical argument. Then there are other people who quite legitimately are worried about cruelty or harm to animals. And with those, we don't really have a problem because the process that we're using doesn't do the animals any harm at all. They still remain sheep and behave like sheep. They've only got one tiny single human gene, so they're not harmed in any way. And the view of the man in the street really is that if we're doing this kind of thing for healthcare reasons, to cure other people, and it's not doing the animals any harm, then they're not particularly concerned about it. So when I look around this room, I look at, at this room, uh, experts who are narrowly In the United States. Well, it's not there. Okay. So that is an example of transgenic farming, right, using um, the gene from a human gene and putting it into an animal to produce human protein. And the reason why that works is because remember that the genetic code is universal. So what that means is, is that um, any organism can read a human gene because their genetic code is exactly the same. So remember that table with the genetic code? That's the universal genetic code. So even bacteria use that same code and can read human genes and produce human proteins. Okay. So we can also talk about um, transgenic um, crops. And so we can talk about them in agriculture. So let me go back. Right. Sometimes these are related as GMO crops, right? genetically modified organisms. And so one that is really common is what is referred to as Bt. And it's really common for corn to be Bt corn. Okay. And this Bt stands for the name of a bacteria. So it's actually Bacillus thuringiensis or something like that. So this is a corn that has a bacterial gene inserted into it. Okay. 
And when they insert the gene in, they insert it into the embryo. And so that means that as the cells reproduce, all of the genes would have that bacterial gene in it, right? And in this case, the bacterial gene um, produces an insecticide. So the insecticide protects, um, which produces an insecticide that protects the corn from a caterpillar and specifically from the um, corn borer caterpillar. So instead of having to spray insecticide over the crop, the crop itself produces its own insecticide. And so there has been some concern, um, primarily because this is actually an insecticide, the BT insecticide was used and approved for um, crops that were organically grown. Um, and there's a concern, there's a couple of concerns. One is, is that if you put the insecticide into the organism, into the plant, then it's everywhere, right? And then that insecticide is going to become useless because it's predicted that if you overuse insecticides, that the um, insects will become resistant to the insecticide. So one possible problem with this, right, and we're going to talk about evolution, but one problem is, is that the um, pests will become resistant to the insecticide over time. Another concern is, is that there are closely related um, weed species, and plants have the ability to transfer genes between each other. There's lots of um, uh, gene flow between um, different um, breeds and uh, crops. And so one other concern is that it will um, be passed the, the gene for the insecticide will be passed to a weed species. So the gene could be passed to a weed species. Okay. And um, one weed that is actually really important um, is um, the milkweed. So the um, pollen of the corn, pollen could drift to other plants. Okay, so the pollen could drift to the other plants. Um, corn is wind pollinated. So when the wind comes up, you sometimes you see the pollen in the air and it could go to another field, but it could also go to um, um, milkweed. And so does anybody know what organism is solely dependent upon milkweed for its survival? Nobody knows? It's a butterfly. What butterfly is solely dependent upon milkweed for its survival? It's the really cool butterfly that migrates to Mexico every year? Monarch. Okay. So this is the monarch butterfly. So this kills monarch butterfly larvae. Now, monarch, butterf oops, monarch butterflies are in big trouble for a lot of reasons. One reason is, is that there's not a lot of milkweed, right, left. Generally, it's just like it's in the ditches by um, like I know when I was growing up in Idaho, it's always like in the irrigation ditches, right? Um, so it's next to the crops, right? And so the um, the monarchs actually come down, and then they have one whole generation, and then the the offspring of that generation actually migrate all the way to Mexico. So it's a migration that actually spans two generations. 
which is kind of a big deal in terms of um, biology because it's the only one that's known to kind of do that. So the monarch butterfly could be at risk if the Bt corn um, is um, too prevalent in the environment. Okay. Okay, so another example of a transgenic crop is what is referred to as Roundup Ready. Ready crops. And so Roundup, this is their spraying Roundup on this one. So Roundup generally kills um, uh, plants, right? So it is a herbicide. So Roundup is a herbicide that kills weeds. A herbicide, oops, that kills weeds. And these are herbaceous plants, right? Um, they are not uh, grasses. So herbicides kill herbaceous plants. So they would also kill like soybeans, right? They would also kill cotton, right? They would also kill, the Roundup would kill those, right? Because it's a herbicide. So the Roundup ready crop um, has a viral gene, okay? So a viral gene, instead of a bacteria, is inserted into the crop and um, protects it from Roundup. Okay. So that's why they can spray Roundup directly on this crop because it is um, protected by that viral gene. So it is Roundup ready. Right? So there's a kind of a concern because um, one problem with specifically Roundup Ready crops is, is that the same people that own the Roundup, that produce Roundup, also own the seed. And so that is Monsanto, and Monsanto has been pretty vociferous about um, patenting their, um, their DNA, right, their creation, so they patent their seeds. And if you are caught using them without buying them, then you are subject to litigation, right? So that's one problem is, is that um, we have kind of a monopoly over the crops that we use. Another problem is, is people foresee is, is that it decreases variation. So if, we are, if we're only planting Roundup Ready crops, then we're not producing crops that have lots of variation in them. And that could be a problem down the road, right? So there's um, a, uh, this idea that we need to go back to having more diversity in our food system. Okay. Okay. So that's the roundup. And so when we look up, um, this is conventional, right? And so look at all the weeds, look at all the dandelions, right? Competing for resources with the crop. And so this is the roundup ready. So they were able to spray it and kill off all the weeds. Okay, so another example of a transgenic organism besides sheep is um, genetically modified salmon. So we can talk about transgenic salmon. And salmon living in the ocean um, tend to stop growing in the winter. So they're not, you know, they, they grow pretty slow in the winter months. And so what they've done is that they've inserted the, um, the, a gene from another fish that grows in cold waters. And so this gene from another fish, another species, that allows the salmon to grow all year long, even in the cold winter months. I can't remember what kind of fish it was. This doesn't say here. Um, what does it say here? So here's my 
growth hormone from Chinook. Oh, ocean pout. So the, the gene is from actually an ocean pout. So they combine it to produce the transgenic salmon. And so if you look at these two salmon, these are the same age. So the genetically altered gets bigger, much faster, which if you're raising salmon to, to sell, that is a really good thing, right? The concern is, is if this ever got out into the wild. So the big concern is, is that if we were able ever, these ever escaped into the wild, they would be much better competitors than the salmon that do not grow fast. And so they would outcompete and actually replace the um, wild stocks of salmon, right? And so the pros would be that they help um, meet the ri rising demand for fish, right? They could reduce the pressure on the wild stocks. Um, they actually eat less, right? And they grow more. But then we're worried that they might escape from farms and um, harm wild salmon populations. Okay. And so the concern is, is that they might not be labeled. So as consumers, we would know whether or not we were purchasing genetically um, modified salmon. So we couldn't make the choice to avoid um, that type of salmon from a, um, from a kind of a capitalistic point of view. Okay. Okay. So those are transgenic organisms. So you should be able to give me an example, define a transgenic organism, and then give me examples of them, right, um, from um, this lecture or from what you know, I don't know, about transgenic organisms. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna move back here, we're gonna talk about gene therapy. So gene therapy is the idea that we can replace defective genes. With ones that work. Now the problem with gene therapy is, is that we generally want to do it not in the embryo, right? Because we don't know if there's a problem in the embryo. So it could be like a baby is born and they have cystic fibrosis. And now we want to give them gene therapy. But the problem is, is that all of their cells in their body have the defective gene. So how do we get this, the gene into multiple cells? And, and we probably have to keep doing it, right? Because the cells might die and would need replaced and they wouldn't be replaced by the ones that have, have had um, been fixed, okay? So an example of this is using a virus to replace a gene in patients that have cystic fibrosis. So to replace the defective gene found in a person with cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is interesting because it's caused by a defect in a protein that is in the plasma membrane of the cell. So we talked about those plasma membrane proteins and how they form channels, right? And so in cystic fibrosis, the chloride channels in the cells do not work. And so what happens is, is that water moves um, into the cell and kind of gets stuck there. And so um, the, the symptoms are that they have mucus buildup in the lungs. So the symptom of a person with cystic fibrosis, one symptom is, is that they have mucus in the lungs, right? Excessive mucus in the lungs. And this can actually um, make them feel like they're suffocating, right? And it can make them also much more susceptible to pneumonia. So bacteria can get into the lungs, it can reproduce, and then you can get um, sick, and you can have the lungs shutting down, right? So um, one way to do this is to give them an inhaler. So you give them an inhaler, right? An inhaler that has the virus. So you inhale or an inhaler with virus, right? And viruses do what they always do. 
they insert their genetic material into the cells. So the, the gene gets inserted into the cells lining the lungs, and then hopefully the person's uh, cell would take up that viral DNA along with the, the, the good DNA and then produce the right protein, right? So that's a, um, an example of gene therapy. So in your, uh, maybe this isn't in your book, this is a diagram that shows how we can put a new gene into the viral DNA, right? And then let the virus infect the cell, right? And then hopefully the cell will incorporate that DNA and start producing the proper protein. So recently there has been um, example, right? In dogs, they're just using dogs as a, um, a trial treatment, right? The experimental treatment. So um, they've been able to um, treat dogs with hemophilia A. And so hemophilia A is the type of uh, hemophilia that in humans is X-linked, right? And it causes severe bleeding. And in the past, it actually um, led to early death. Now we have um, clotting factors that we can give people, right? So, um, so they used a virus to carry the normal gene for factor eight into the platelets, and then the blood cells and were able to um, um, repair the damage and prevent the, the people from bleeding, right? And so platelets are what produce clotting factors. And so instead of inject, inhaling it in, into them, they um, actually put um, it into the blood, okay? So that is gene therapy, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna stop there for today. We have lab today or lab on Monday. Okay, you wanna decide which one you wanna come to. And we're gonna be doing more molecular genetics in lab.